Spotlight is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. It seeks to spotlight people, places, and events from around the Diocese of Youngstown that promote the new gospel of joy called for by Pope Francis. Your program host is Father James Corda. Hello and welcome to Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. Joining me today is Dr. Louis Zona, who is the Executive Director of the Butler Art Museum. Dr. Zona, it's such a pleasure to oh, have you on the show. Father, today. it's a great joy to be here. You know, the Butler is really a, an institution in, in our city and is well known throughout, throughout the country. What is so significant about the Butler? I think the, the main uh, element of the Butler's fame is its permanent collection. And, and, and it goes back to the founder of the museum, Joseph Green Butler Jr., who was a steel man, made his fortune in the steel industry, but, but believed that Americans were great artists. When his contemporaries were going to Europe to acquire art, Mr. Butler was buying American art. So consequently, anybody doing an, an exhibition of American art anywhere in the world calls the butler because not only do we have an example by that particular artist that might be exhibited but we have a prime example so it's a, it's a it's a collection that won't stop it's just a wonderful wonderful collection and that's the basis of the reputation it is exclusively american mm -hmm. art isn't it it is exclusively american art although we have exhibited works by non-americans but in terms of the permanent collection what we acquire it's all american Today, there are 21,000 artworks in the Butler Collection, uh, spanning, uh, well, the earliest work is 1719. It gives you an idea of the, of the mm -hmm. incredible nature of that collection. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the history of art. Uh, goes way, way, way back. Um, why, why was civilization so interested in, in art and, and even architecture? What made it so... Uh, inviting. Well, I think it's interesting. I always ask my students, why did the cave dwellers create art? Mm. Well, and, and the, the answers are, are interesting, and they're the same reasons that art, that art exists today. First of all, uh, the religious element of it. Mm. The idea that uh, the, the, these cave dwellers would would they, 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 they more than sensed uh, that there was something greater than themselves. And, and so the, the direction of the, of the drawings of the, of the animals, and there's, there's, an, there's a, a spiritual element to it. Self-expression is another reason. Uh, the need for, for humans to, to make a statement graphically. Uh, I always tell students that if that if some government would prevent you from making art, destroy all the art materials in, in the world, we would be ending up drawing in the dirt. I mean, there's a need for self-expression. Uh, decoration, that's probably the least of the, the reasons, but who wants to live in a drab cave? You know? What about this, let's go back to that whole sense of art and religion. Sure. How does it, how does it uh, uh, interact and how does it gel uh, copacetically? You know, there, when we go back to uh, perhaps the great age of faith during the medieval period in the, in the Renaissance, um, the, the, the works were quite literal. There's an image of Jesus. There's an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Caravaggio's... Uh, uh, great paintings of the apostles. Mm -hmm. Today, we don't, we don't find that, you know, art, that artists are directly uh, uh, portraying images of Christ and the apostles. But the very act of creation, the very act of making something out of nothing, is, a, is an incredible homage to, to our Lord. Uh, Jackson Pollock, for example, uh, is, is a good example. His, his works are, are not literal at all. In fact, you, you won't find a subject matter in them at all. 
yet his work is very, very spiritual. It, 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 it is its uniqueness. It's, again, created from nothing. And uh, it's, it, it parallels the ultimate act of creation. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question, but... You, you did. And let's go to another uh, question. Um, some people look at art and say, why would anyone like that? And some people look at it and right away they can resonate with it. They know exactly what the artist is trying to, to tell them. Is it our perspective that's different? Sure it is. And, you know, uh, just like uh, not all of us like the same dessert. I mean, uh, art speaks to us on a very personal level. It's so interesting. You, you might find a piece of popular music that just thrills you and you share it with a friend and they're thinking, what does he see in this piece? And, and again, it, it is a very, very personal thing. The artist is making a personal statement, and that, per, that personal statement may or may not appeal to us. I, for example, I mentioned Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. I love Jackson Pollock's work. I just am thrilled by it. When I go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, I stand in front of my favorite Jackson Pollock work, and I get lost in it. And there are other people who scratch their heads saying, why is that art? You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's quite an interesting thing and I don't know that there's an answer. Let's go back, uh, we're down to the last few minutes of our first sure. segment. Let's go back to the butler itself and let's talk about some of the uh, significance of the butler in American art in the country and what makes it so significant. And again, the, the, it's the, the, first of all, it's the first museum dedicated to American art. Historically, it's very, very important. Again, the, the, the founder was doing something that really no one else was doing. His contemporaries, the Vanderbilts and, and, and the wealthy, the Rockefellers, were going to Europe and buying Monet's and Renoir's when, when Butler was buying Albert Bierstadt and, and Winslow Homer and John Singer Sargent. And uh, so that's, that's, that makes it significant. Just recently, we had Kim Novak, the, the famous uh, movie star, uh, now 81 years old, who loves art, who, who believes that art is a healing thing. In fact, uh, she says that art has, had saved her life. Uh, uh, walking through the butler with her uh, the other morning, was thrilling for me because she truly appreciated what was on the walls and she said, there's nothing like this anywhere. It's wonderful. People of Youngstown should be so proud of this. And I said, they are, they yeah. are. We're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about that, but we're gonna take a quick break. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Doesn't your child deserve the best education possible? Then you should consider a Catholic school where strong academics are offered in a safe, disciplined environment, where education is deeply rooted in the religious teachings of our Catholic faith, where graduation rates are exceptional, where outstanding teachers help your child reach his or her fullest potential in the classroom and in life. But you should consider a Catholic school for the most important reason of all. Your child is worth it. Light Moments. Here's Father Tom McSweeney. Picture this. You're on your way to work this morning and you see a traffic cop doing the mambo. Sound crazy? Well, that's what people in Thailand see every day. To ease rush hour congestion at Bangkok's busiest intersection, Lieutenant Colonel Yodkai Pusante instructed his 16-man crew to smile, pirouette, and samba. And as a result, hairy drivers have lightened up and overworked cops feel better. And the traffic, well, the traffic's still at a dead halt, but hey, two out of three isn't bad. Creativity and a sense of humor can be the solution to a good deal of our problems. They can also relieve the stress that keeps us from finding the right answer. So next time you're faced with a dilemma, try looking for humor in the situation. That may not solve everything, but at least it'll leave you smiling. This message from the Christophers, New York, New York, 10017. Welcome back to Spotlight. I'm talking with Dr. Louis Zona of the Butler Art. Uh, Dr. Zona, we ended up with uh, your wonderful visit with Kim Novak. Mm. And um, I remember as a young, uh, a young child in, I think I was in probably fourth grade, and I took lessons at the Butler Art. Uh, I think it was a Saturday mm. we went there for lessons. 
And I remember being so thrilled that one or two of my watercolors were featured. And of course, this goes way back in the, the 60s. How exciting is it for someone to, uh, to have that, that personal connection with the butler? Um, and over your many years there, what are some of the other experiences you've had of people coming have resonated with that experience? You know, it, it is amazing. Artists all over the country want to be exhibited at the Butler. So every day I either get emails or I get packets in the mail with, with discs, uh, look at my work. Uh, uh, a couple of artists from the West Coast contacted me the other day. We, we want to do a show of our, of our still life paintings and they, these are very good artists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we only have so much space and there's only so much time, so we have to make the decisions. But it goes to, to the point that the butler has this wonderful, wonderful reputation where people want to be associated. They want their work hanging down the gallery from John Singer Sargent or Winslow Homer. And, and it's a big boost to the artist to be able to, to do that. I guess there are parallels. It would be like a, a young musician getting to perform with Bruce Springsteen mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and that's the way it is with the Butler Institute. So it, it's an interesting position that I'm in having to, to, to make these kinds of decisions. But we, tr we do a couple of things. First of all, we want quality. But also, we, we want works of art that are going to be appreciated by the community. And uh, sometimes there are controversial things, too, Father. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you one that, that uh, happened to me a while back. Uh, and it, it involves my Catholic faith. faith. When, when we agreed to do an exhibit uh, that the Ohio Arts Council sponsored, and we love the Ohio Arts Council because they've been very good to the museum su su supporting their projects. Uh, but uh, a, a group of women artists, one of them decided to take a, a shot or two at, at our Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, while I, my mother is no longer alive, as I looked at that work of art, I, I thought, what would my mother say? You know, so I had to make a tough decision there, and you know what it was. Mm -hmm. And it sure. was to protect the community and, pr and protect uh, our faith as well. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's America, there, there's artistic freedom, and I, I, but I think our freedoms end when we attack uh, others. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the, this particular instance, it was an attack on this a single artist attacking my faith, and sure. uh, it was very uncomfortable for me, to say the least. Well, congratulations on standing <laughs> up for that, and I, I'm sure that there are many others who supported that decision uh, by you. Let's talk now about um, coll art collections. You know, we've always heard how the wealthy and many, um, many of Hollywood's elite have wonderful art collections, and we've heard that over the years. What makes a collection, a private or a, a public collection, what, what actually makes someone's collection significant? Well, a good example would be Steve Martin, the, the comedian, actor, uh, his collection is blessed to have uh, several works by Edward Hopper. Edward Hopper is arguably America's most important mid-20th century artist, with the possible exception of Pollock, but Hopper was the great realist of American uh, art history. Um, his, his work is, is uh, beloved in the art world. And here's Steve Martin with several excellent examples of his work. In fact, uh, 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 the late uh, Andy Williams also had a, a wonderful collection. And what made his collection famous was the fact that Kenneth Noland, who was also one of the great abstract painters of the 20th century, uh, is in his collection. I remember seeing a, a photograph of his, of his bedroom with a, a Morris Lewis painting hanging above the bed. Well, Morris Lewis was a, was a legend. Um, so it has to do with the, with the names that are in the collection, uh, in addition to, obviously, uh, aesthetic importance. but. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the quality of the collection is, is 
based upon uh, the, the nature of the work in that collection. And, and if it's a big name artist, it's important. Now, I would imagine that you travel around the country to different museums or exhibits. What do you find when you do visit other places? Um, and I wouldn't want you to compare Butler, but what do you see around our country? I think one of the things, we had an art historian uh, come through the museum uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, who was doing a project in Pittsburgh. He had always wanted to see the, uh, the Butler Institute. Now I'm, I'm trying to remember what you asked me, Father. About visiting, of, that's right, about yeah, visiting well, different well, museums. Yeah, well, he visited us, and he, he uh, after an hour with him, my head was ten times as big. Be, because he said, you know, this museum is unique. Mm -hmm. Not only the quality of the work here, but the fact that, that you don't take an aesthetic position. You show, you show every kind of philosophy of the last 300 years in American art, and not a lot of museums do this. Mm -hmm. They have their point of view. You, your point of view is a very general one, and you open it up. If, if somebody is interested in traditional realist painting, You've got it. Mm -hmm. If somebody is interested in, it, in the avant-garde, you've got that. If somebody is interested in new media, digital work, you've got that. Mm -hmm. And so we are, I think that's what makes us unique. And as I travel, frankly, I don't see that. I do see the point of view. I do see the fact that certain artists are now in the basements of these museums or in storage. Mm -hmm. Whereas we try to paint a, a very broad picture. A, People, if some people have asked, do you like all the work in the, in the collection? Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you, you can't like it all. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I try, to, try to represent every major direction that American art has taken over the, over the 300 year period. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, and we're going to also talk about your book. <laughs> and we're, before we do that though, we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. I am Marino. Je suis Marino. I am Marino. I believe that we are all connected to each other, and that it is the gift of compassion that unites us and makes us one. It doesn't matter what language, culture, or tradition we come from. We can share compassion wherever we are. Marino, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Marino dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, and with your help, they can do more. Missioners, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Marino. I am Marino. Yo soy Marino. I'm Father Mike, and I am Marino. 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 Hi, I'm Mark Quinn. As I grew up on the south side of Chicago, the Dominican Sisters of Springfield not only taught me, but formed me in my Catholic faith. I owe them so much. That's why I make an annual donation to the Retirement Fund for Religious. Do you remember the religious men and women who shaped your life? Say thank you to them by donating to the Retirement Fund for Religious at your local parish. Join me, share in the care. Welcome back, I'm talking with Dr. Zona of the Butler Art. Uh, you have a book uh, called Art, Life, and Baseball. Now when you have the title, did you put it in priority, Art, Life, and Baseball, or is that just the way it, it happened? Well, it's, it's more about life than it is about art and baseball, mm -hmm. although they're, you know, all, all of my, all of my issues are, are raised in the book, and uh, like we were talking off the air, I feel so good after I write, write each one of these little things. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it. I, I, I have, and there's some uh, fun things that, that I'd like to point out. Before we do that, one in particular was about Clyde Singer. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about him. Say something about the short brief that you wrote about him. Well, Clyde was, uh, Clyde also was a living legend. He was Youngstown's uh, greatest artist. Uh, he trained during the Great Depression uh, in, at the Art Students League in New York. His teachers were some of the great artists of the time, like Reginald Marsh and Kenneth Hayes Miller. Uh, 
uh, he, he was on his way to stardom in the art world when the war hit. And he served in the South Pacific Second World War. And when he came back, the art world had changed. No longer was traditional realism, which he was a part of, uh, in vogue. It was abstraction. And so Clyde, who knows what would have happened to his career had that not happened. Um, but it did happen, and so he wrote a letter to Mr. Butler, and he said, do you, if you need somebody to, to help you, I can do a lot of different things. I can paint signs, I, can, I know some art history, I know the, and what a, what a wonderful thing it was that he came to Youngstown and, and served at the Butler as curator for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a, a, my favorite line, how are you this morning, Clyde? Ah, Lou, I don't know whether I'm pitching or catching. <laughs> That's a good one. Let's go to uh, another one that I really like was, um, and we talked about it just briefly, life and art, mm -hmm. you know, and how those two kind of mingle together. I've often thought that, that every one of us is an artist in some regards, uh, not necessarily in the medium of watercolors or paint right. or charcoal, but we are, we are all creating something right. by our life. And, and how does that, uh, interact together in the, the brief article that you wrote about art and life? Well, I, I think in, in trying to recall the article, but I, I do have uh, strong feelings that all of us are, are, are artists. Uh, we all have had unique experiences, and the one thing we treasure about art is that the artist is, is trying to make a unique statement. And each of us, I mean, we've had upbringings that are so different than other people. We have had experiences that are so different than other people. So each of us have something to say, whether it's done in, with a paintbrush or whether it's done with a pen or however it's done. And uh, um, this is why I think it's important, it's also important to, to emphasize um, art in the schools because it, it allows that uniqueness to come out. Uh, and uh, I think it's kind of sad that uh, we're losing a lot of these programs in the schools. But. I know when, uh, when I served as pastor uh, in several parishes and all of those parishes had a school, one of the, uh, the least funded programs obviously was the art program. And I remember one of the schools uh, was in our inner city and we started a program called Art on the Cart because we didn't have a classroom for art. And so art was on this wonderful giant cart that we had and it went room to room. But when that cart entered that room, these students were just uh, transfixed and changed and they could express themselves in ways that they couldn't. Father, my first job was in the Sharon City Schools as a, as a traveling art teacher to the different schools. So all the art supplies were in my trunk. Well, I arrived at Wengler School one morning a little early. And so I decided to close my eyes while I'm sitting in my car, resting my eyes for a little while. And when I opened my eyes, there's all these little faces around the car pressed against the windows. The art teacher had come. The art teacher had come. It was a special day. For sure. One of the other uh, short pieces in your book that I like was the one on heroes. We all have uh, personal heroes. Uh, you know, many young kids, if you ask them who's your hero, they'll point the, to one of their parents uh, or maybe an older sibling. Why are heroes important to us? Oh, I think it's uh, most of us uh, have our father mother as our heroes and, and that certainly is true with me but I think it's important to have these I these ideals as we see them although we realize sometimes uh, later that our heroes my hero growing up even though well my hero was Mickey Mantle uh, the great baseball player for the New York Yankees I loved me I used to draw pictures of Mickey Mantle my room was filled with Mickey Mantle stuff and then, and then years later, I, I hear that my idol was drunk most of the time when he was sitting on the bench at Yankee Stadium. He had a terrible alcoholic problem mm -hmm. and was not the sweetest man in the world. And later on in his life, he admits to all that. And, and he, he asked people like me to please forgive him, which, mm -hmm. I, of course, I did. But our, 
but uh, sometimes maybe it's best that we stay with uh, those ideals like, like dad and mom. Mm -hmm. you know? The other article that I really liked in your book was on supermarkets. And <laughs> I don't know how many times I've gone into a supermarket and obviously the first question they ask me is, what are you doing here? Well, I buy groceries like everyone else does. Uh, and oftentimes I'll know the person, but sometimes I don't remember their names or they'll remind me and I, I'm just trying to put them into some perspective. You know, so that happens a lot, but isn't the supermarket just a wonderful way of seeing people? It, it sure is. And, and, and the, 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 the phenomenon in, in most, most recently is people talking on the telephone in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. Back when I was a kid, if you were talking to yourself, you know, there was something wrong. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, their, their Bluetooth or whatever yes. is in their ear and they're talking to their husband at home saying, is this, did you really want carnations, uh, this or that? Mm -hmm. Uh, it is it is really interesting how you run into people and uh, you can make some great friendships with strangers uh, over some oranges. It's it's a lot of fun. To yeah. We're down to the last two minutes okay. of our time together. Uh, I remember when I interviewed you for one of our wineskin shows, uh, and you gave me your book, and you says, no, "Don't forget to read." the the short one on bread <laughs> well i read that it's right after you left and I, I read it again not that we have to talk about that particular part of the bread but how significant for us in in, in our world bread is yeah it sure is and and, and the the good lord uh, used it also uh, to, to to more than make the point but uh, yeah it, it, i enjoyed writing that and, and recalling uh, my childhood in a bakery that got into some controversy over bread, and I won't I won't divulge it. Father, well, maybe the, maybe our our, our wa people watching this will will want to buy the book. And Definitely. by the way, the, the the book is is produced by the Butler Institute for the Butler Institute, um, and all the money goes to the Butler's programs. Well, Dr. Luizona, it's such a pleasure <laughs> to have you on Spotlight today. Uh, thank you for. Uh, making the butler just come more alive for us. And thank you for the wonderful work you've been doing since 1981. Oh, that makes me feel real good, Father. Thank you so much. I loved every minute of it. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day, and God be with you. Spotlight has been a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown, your program host was Father James Corda. There is a place where a total stranger will give you their blood. A place where someone you never knew will save your child from drowning. Where a person who doesn't look like you talk like you, or dress like you, will give you shelter after a flood. That place is called America, where we look out for each other. When you help the American Red Cross, you help America. Join us for our weekly broadcast of Music and the Spoken Word with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir.